Alright, so our objective today is to learn how to read the weather maps. Your essential question is how to use weather symbols to predict weather conditions. Okay? Now, we're going to do this. Uh, these, these are going to be Cornell notes, and they're going to look a little bit weird and a little bit different. So don't put anything in your notebook yet. I'm going to show you how to do it as soon as we finish uh, writing all the notes. So the first thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at a uh, cope, the different fronts that we have. And these symbols are symbols that you will see on a weather map. So we're going to start off with cold front. Now what I want you to notice about the cold front is that it's always going to be blue and you're always going to see little triangles, okay? Think of those little triangles as icicles. Don't icicles have a little point to them? Yeah. Okay, so icicles are always cold, all right? Now, these icicles are going to be moving in the direction of where the uh, front is moving. So if that was on a map, what direction is that front moving? Okay, direction, north. Okay, so it's going to be moving north. So make sure that you kind of no, it doesn't go. Make sure that you kind of, you pay attention to the direction of the different things on here. Okay, so what we know about a cold front is. Basically, what is occurring is that the cold air is going under the warm air. Why would cold air go under warm air? It's density. Because of density. It's, it's not less dense, it's more dense. So since cold air is more dense than warm air, that cold air moves under the warm air, and the warm air rises. Now, when that occurs, we can predict that... Rain and thunderstorms might develop. So usually when we see that a cold front is going to move in, of course the temperatures are going to become cooler. And not necessarily mean is it has to be freezing, but the temperatures will be a little cooler because cold air is moving in. But when that occurs, usually what we can predict is rain and maybe some thunderstorms. So if you went out and you watched the news tonight and you saw that a cold front was north of us and it was pointing south, so the little icicles are pointing south, you can predict that in the next couple days it would rain and it'd be cooler temperatures, right? Okay. So any questions over the cold front? All right, so now we're going to move on to the warm front. I want you to look at these symbols. Okay? Warm front will always be red, and it's going to have those half circles. Now, whenever you get a sunburn, and it's a really, really bad sunburn, could you get some blisters? Yeah. And what do blisters look like? Circles. Little bumps, right? So think of these as little blisters. They're always going to be warm. And the reason I'm saying this is because let's say you get a test where it's not in color, so that you don't see blue or red, but can you distinguish the different symbols? Yeah. Okay. That's why you also need to make sure that you remember what the symbol looks like. Or warm, like, All right. like the sun red. Oh, warm, like the sun red. Yeah. So in a warm front, what happens is warm air is coming in. And that warm, moist air rises over the mass of cold air. So the, move, the air that is moving, or the wind that is moving, is warm, and it's moving into an area, and obviously it's going to move above the cold air. <coughs> and it moves above the cold air because, once again, warm air rises because of what? Density. Density. Okay? Now, when that occurs, <coughs> usually we see warm fronts near high, uh, near, I'm sorry, near low pressure systems which we're going to talk about in a little bit. That's the second bullet rule. And it brings strong winds. So you get a windy uh, time whenever you have a warm front come in. And obviously the temperatures can uh, warm up a little bit. 
And the reason it's bringing those strong winds is because of that movement of air that is going to be moving up over the cooler. So those two are pretty simple because then you only have to look at one, either a little semicircle or a triangle. But now we come down to what we call an occluded front. <clears throat> an occluded front is one in which you see both a triangle and a semicircle. Sometimes these on maps are done in like purplish, okay, because they mix these two colors. All right? But as long as you understand that the triangles and the circles are pointing in the same direction, that's always going to be an occluded front. Now, what's occurring here is that fast cold air overtakes the warm air and lifts the air up. So, in this case, you basically have like a warm air mass and a cold air mass moving in the same direction, but the cold air, which moves quicker, actually overtakes the warm air, lifting that air up, or so pushing that, air, that warm air up. When you have an occluded front, that's when you get like the worst features of both cold and warm air because they're moving simultaneously. So since they're moving together, all of their bad um, weather systems or their the bad predictions mix together. So this is when you have like showers and continuous rain, low visibility. Um, so this is basically when you probably don't want to be out on the street just because you really can't see because it's raining continuously. And since it's in continuous rain, then that's when you also have some possibilities of um, flooding and things like that. And the reason for this is because both the warm air and the cold air are moving in the same direction. So they're mixing and, um, <coughs> and their worst features come out. Then you have something called a stationary front. Now, even before I open this up, what does the word stationary mean? Still, Still or not moving, right? Well, guess what? That's what it is. Now, if we look, now I have cold air moving one direction and warm air moving the other. So this is when you have air masses moving in opposite directions. And because they're moving in opposite directions, they kind of slow each other down. Okay. Doesn't that make sense? Whenever you're walking in the hallway, if everybody was walking in the same direction, couldn't you move much faster than when people are walking in opposite directions? Because don't you have to slow down and move over when people don't move whenever they see you coming? Because they're not walking on the right side. Okay? <clears throat> so, in this case, since the air masses move in opposite directions, they end up slow, uh, moving very slow. They're not moving at all. So they're stationary. They're not moving. And the warm and the cold air aren't going to mix. So basically, since there's really not any motion, the, the air masses really aren't mixing. They're not doing anything with each other. Um, then basically the area, the weather in that area really doesn't change. Is there, can they cause a tornado? No, because, well, if there's already tornado there, it, basically whatever weather there is right now, it's not going to change. So if you're having thunderstorms, have them. If you're having sunny time, continue having sunny time. Okay. So you need to make sure that you know the symbols, and the different types of weather systems or predictions that you can make whenever you see those symbols. Basically, on Monday, what's going to happen when you come in, I'm going to give you two weather maps, and you have to predict the weather in the different places just by looking at the symbols. Now, there are two more symbols we need to do, which is the other page. Okay? So I'm going to go on to that, ne to that next one. This next one is a high pressure and a low pressure area. So, high 
High pressure is always going to be a big H, usually in blue. Low pressure will always be a big L, usually in red. So go ahead and draw those there. So you're going to have high pressure system and a low pressure system. Now, all of these symbols, really, you should have seen. I'm hoping that at one time or another, you actually turn on the TV into something other than your reality shows that are like rotting your brain. And you've seen, I'm sure, a weather map at one time or another. If you haven't, oh my god, I'm so sad for you. Yes. Stop watching all those dumb programs that are rotting your TV. brain. Okay? I don't watch TV. So, looking at high pressure system, basically you're going to see a big H in areas of whatever country you're looking at. In this case, we would be looking at the United States. In a high pressure system, when there's a high pressure system in an area, basically what it ha what's happening is that the air is very dense. So if it is very dense, is it cool air or is it warm air? Cool. That's why it's in blue. Wow. Man, there's a reason for all this stuff. No, no, but when we talk about stars and we talk about heat. But remember, most people would not get that. So right, right here, whenever they use blue and red, they're actually talking about temperature of your water and things like that. But, and that's, it makes it confusing, but just kind of think about it. In this, in this case, we're looking at colors that every single person in the world, even if they didn't take science, would understand. Okay? And for the most part, every single person in the world would say that blue is cold. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> the air in a high pressure system is very, very dense because it's cooler. Okay. Winds tend to move clockwise. So the type of weather, <coughs> excuse me, that you end up having a high pressure in a high pressure system is cool, dry. So you don't have a lot of humidity. Okay. It's sunny. You usually have very, very nice weather when you have a high pressure system. Okay. So when you have a high pressure system, you can predict that you're going to have a nice, you know, a nice weather. Sunny skies, not many uh, clouds out there. Clear okay, clear clear skies. And as the day goes by, the temperature's going to increase. So it's going to be nice. It's going to be a day that you want to be outside. Yeah. Okay? Now, when it comes to low pressure systems, Air now is less dense. So since the air is less dense, it is going to move upwards, correct? It's going to rise. So if that air is rising, what's end up, what ends up happening is you end up having strong winds because now your air is moving from the bottom to the top. So it's going to create a motion of air, which is wind. So when low pressure systems you tend to have cloudy weather because you have that movement of air and that movement of, um, of water up, making clouds. You have winds because, once again, it's air that is moving from the bottom to the top, so it's going to create a motion of air, which is wind. Any moment you have air that moves from one place to the other, that's considered wind. Okay? And then here you tend to have low temperatures throughout the day. So, when you see a high pressure system, that's going to be a very, very nice day. Okay? Low pressure system would be a nice day for a person that likes it cloudy and boom. Which is not me. Okay? All right. Now, these are going to go on page 138 and 139 in your... Notebook. Now, you can set these two up in one of two ways because these are chronometers. 
You can either make this entire thing, the Cornell notes, and then put one here and one here, questions here, summary down here. Or you can separate these two into two Cornell notes, and then it's the same essential question which is on the board, and then questions here, questions over the uh, symbols, and then questions over the pressures. However you want to do it, if you want to do it where if you just have one set of questions and summary for both of them, you can. If you want to do them separately, you can do that also. But both pages, if you do it in two pages, it's the same essential question. How to use weather symbols to predict weather conditions. So you decide if you just want to do one column with questions for both of them, or you want to just do them separately. But they should go on page 138 and 139 of your notebook. Any questions? How many personnel questions are Remember, it's up to you. You decide. You're supposed to chunk the notes. So if you chunk them, how many chunks are you going to have with these? Two. Really? Just two? Six. Six? You have to know about each and every one. Okay? If you were going to do it in two separate pages, then you need two summaries. If you're going to do it one, then you can just do it one. All right, so any, uh, any questions on how to set these notes up? Okay. So go ahead and start taping these things in. I do not want you...